two 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 people. So <laughs> I will actually watch it on Facebook. That makes it. Um, I want to welcome everybody for coming. To, thank you for coming tonight. As I know, it's a busy time. And I said, you know, I was talking to Jen. She's like, I, I might have a nervous breakdown before I get here, right? <laughs> so she got here, thank God. Um, and it's a great uh, opportunity to um, to take a little bit of a break and um, prepare spiritually for the same. Um, obviously, uh, there's there's so much to reflect on, and uh, you know, I I uh, there's been a lot of discussion on talking about what kind of Seder these, these are these days, the difference between our Siddharam, so this, reflecting on the Seder from last year and the unique Seder that God, you know, that's, was so incredibly challenging. And then the new Passover was so incredibly challenging last year, as well as, uh, as, well as the Siddharam this year is still, we're still not there and we're hoping next year in Jerusalem, right? <laughs> um, the, uh, but but in the same time, I actually wanted to discuss something a little bit different. Um, and uh, so we're going to sort of go back and try to sound a little smart at our Seder. And that's what we're going to be focusing on tonight. Uh, the topic of tonight is is comparing the Seder and the symposium. And we're going to explain all of that, what that all that means. Thanks, Sharon. I got your, your text. Um, I do want to thank uh, our sponsor for this evening. Our sponsor for the evening is, uh, we thank the Brett and Daniel Gibson who are sponsoring tonight's class and tomorrow and see him as well tomorrow in honor of all the members of the OAP community. How and so thankful holding. I've gotten so much help from the community and Rabbi Eben. Uh, thank you, Chag Sameach, B'Shana Haba, B'Yerushalayim. Thank you so much, Brett and, uh, and Daniel. And uh, we say, Chazak Baruch, you can to be, continue to be strong. Okay, who's excited about this class? You're going to see here this class. If, if you don't get smarter from this class, you're not listening. Because this class is like, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pin myself because uh, that's what I'm told I'm supposed to do. Here we go. Okay. Um, and, uh, but uh, I, uh, we're, we have a source sheet. We're going to tackle something. But at the same time, uh, I would like to hear from you. So if you have... Uh, some insights, something, a question, please jump in at any time. Okay? So here's the deal. Thank you. Seder, the, 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 the Haggadah, if you, every year, there are new Haggadahs that come out. And when I say new ones, I mean like a million new ones, because everybody and their grandmother has printed. Right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute everybody. So this, and then again, if you have something to share, please please unmute yourself. Okay. Um, but everybody and their grandmother, uh, so, I mean, I have friend, I had a friend who told me that he printed a Haggadah. Why did he print a Haggadah? Why did he publish a Haggadah? Because everybody else had a Haggadah. So he figured he might as well publish a Haggadah as well, because everybody's got a Haggadah. And you know why everybody has a Haggadah and their angle, and you have the open Orthodox Haggadah, and then you have the ultra Orthodox Haggadah, and then you have the, this Haggadah, and that Haggadah. You have a million Haggadahs, the, the, the United Negro College Fund Haggadah, and the Haggadah. Like everything is a Haggadah. And why do we have so many Haggadahs? Because everybody has their own point of view, and everybody has their own analysis of this book, of this small book. And you know why everybody has their own analysis? Because no one understands it. <laughs> no one understands it because the truth is, is that this story, this Haggadah, this way of telling this Seder, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And what we're going to do is we're going to sort of try to tackle it, going back to the very beginning, from just a very big, a very good place to start, to try to get an understanding of where this all came from and why, uh, why was the Haggadah written the way it was. And that's not to say that all these people have their nuanced views of and 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 dissecting every word of the of the Haggadah, that they don't have a good point. And, but there's there's a method to the madness. There's a background to all of this, and I'm hoping that you'll get a better appreciation of the Haggadah and the Seder, uh, and you can share it and sound smart at your Seder. So who's with me? Everybody with me? Right. Okay. Um, Let's start with our source sheet, okay? Let me share my screen. Can everybody see my source sheet? How to sound smart at your Seder, the Seder versus the symposium, yes? Great, okay. So I came across this, uh, some of this, much of this class is based on a, a talk by Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik, 
who uh, gave a talk on the Tikva Tikva podcast, gave a Tikva through Tikva. Um, he gave eight classes on the Haggadah, and one class he gave, actually, I think was the final one of the class, was specifically about the Afikomen and the cup of Elijah. But he really gave a lot of background, which sort of inspired me to do a little more reading. And as I was Googling, which is amazing, this Google thing, as I typed it in the Google, I found an article that we're going to read together. It's a very brief article. It's written by Rabbi Professor Golinkin uh, on the topic is Seder Origins in the Seder Symposium. The article was first published in the Jerusalem Post. Professor Golinkin, um, I, it's, he spells it different than Larry, I can just tell you that. But Professor Golinkin is a uh, professor at the at Schechter, at the Schechter Institute, I think it is. Um, and he did, uh, he did some research, which has been going around. Um, uh, it stems from uh, an article by uh, uh, Professor Saul Lieberman in 1957 and others as well, basically trying to get an understanding of where this whole Seder thing comes from. Because the truth is, is that originally we have the Seder, that we have the, the Pesach experience, which took place in Egypt, right? That's when the first quote unquote Seder was. And let me just tell you, they didn't sing Dayenu, I guarantee. They didn't sing Chad Gadja, I guarantee. They didn't do Kaddish, Urkats, Kapras, Yachats, all these things. They didn't do any of this. All they did was have their matzah and their maror and their Passover sacrifice, which was a roasted lamb, which they put together as a, in a sandwich. And of course, they made, what do we call that, Deborah? Roasted, roasted lamb, lettuce, and, uh, and a flatbread. Laffa. Laffa. Falafa and a shawarma. There we go. Are you eating that tonight? Uh, maybe. We should have had that. <laughs> We're having pizza. <laughs> We're having pizza, right? So, like all other good Jews on the two days before Pesach. One year, and God willing, I'm going to sponsor a shawarma night for one of these classes. But that's what they had. All of the stuff of the Seder and the Haggadah came and evolved much later. In fact, much of it comes from the 10th chapter of Mesechet Psachim, the tract of Psachim, the Babylonian Talmud, and as well as the Jerusalem Talmud, which we just happened to learn the Daf Yomi over the last few weeks. Um, but otherwise, this stuff kind of evolved. The rabbis, in the time of the Talmud, or the time of the Mishnah, the Mishnah is going to be the third, second to fourth century, and the Talmud is going to be fifth to the fourth to the sixth century, the rabbis kind of made this into something that didn't exist before. And what were they trying to do? What was their agenda? And this is where we're going to read this article together. Okay? It says, where did the Seder come from? There was no Seder in the biblical period. The Torah instructs us to eat the Paschal lamb with matzah and marah, just like I said, and that the father should teach his son about the exodus from Egypt. Similarly, the Seder is not mentioned in the Second Temple sources, such as Philo and, or, or in Josephus. It is not first mentioned in the Mishnah and the Tosefta, chapter 10 of Sachem, which date from, from shortly before or after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 of the Common Era, really afterwards. And he asks, what is the source of the elaborate rituals and literacy forms of the Seder? As we said, there's so, people go to a Seder and there is so much written about the Haggadah, but where did it all come from? You know, I, we have this joke, this running joke. I, may, I mentioned it probably every class on Pesach. We refer to the Baal Haggadah, right? The author of the Haggadah, the person who composed the Haggadah. And he is so famous because we have no idea who he is, right? His name is not Maxwell House. Uh, one year I gave a talk on where the Maxwell House Haggadah came from. That's for another, what's the word? Well, this, that's not for this year, right? But uh, they, somebody put together all these different parts and made a Seder of the 15 steps of the Haggadah. But the truth is, is that they made it up. It was not from biblical times. It wasn't even from temple times. In fact, the, the Seder that we have today really it looks very, very different than the Seder that they had or the, whatever they called it, they didn't call it a Seder, the Seder that they had at the time of the temple, when the, the night of Passover that they had at the night of time of the temple. So here we're going to continue. Siegfried Stein proved conclusively in an article in 1957 that many of the Seder rituals and literary forms were borrowed from the Hellenistic banquet or symposium, let us first compare the rituals. Hellenism, of course, is Greek. And so we have the, the Seder is modeled after a Greek, we're gonna call this, the word is symposium, which was a special gathering 
of meals and discussion as we're going to about to discuss. Here it goes. The Mishnah states that all Jews of the Seder must recline on a couch. Now, of course, it's all Greek to me. I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. Athenius, sounds good, relates that in Homer's time, men still feasted sitting, but gradually they slid from chairs to couches, taking as their ally relaxation and ease. Furthermore, one must recline on one's left arm while eating, so too at a symposium. So the model, if you look at an ancient Seder, um, which the way it's described in the Talmud, they're all lying on these couches and they're having, what the, they have these little tables, we call these like lazy Susans, I think that's what it's called, right? So, and that, why are they doing, that was what it was, now we're at a table, we have, we have these stupid pillows that my kid brings home from school and I have to recline and it's really annoying or whatever. And why are we doing that? We're doing that because that's what they did back then. But that's because the, what the rabbis were trying to replicate of this Greek symposium. Let's continue. At the cedar, the chazeret, which, or the marar, the lettuce, was dipped in salt water or other, sorry, that's karpas, or other liquids until the main course was served. Similarly, Athenius, 200 of the, of the common era, mentions lettuce seven times in his learned banquet. Karoset was an integral part of the seder, as is mentioned in the tractate in the, in the Mishnah. Once again, Athenius describes similar dishes at length and discusses whether they should be served before or after dinner. Hill the Elder used to eat a sandwich of the Paschal lamb, Amatza Omar Yochluhu, right? That's what we call Korech. Similarly, the Greeks and Romans used to eat a sandwich bread with lettuce. The Mishnah rules that one may not add an afikoman after the Paschal lamb. Professor Lumen proves, and we're going to get more into the discussion with this, that this mission is opposed to the Greek custom of the epikoman. As explained in the Talmud Yushami, one should not stand up from the eating group and join the eating group after eating the Paschal lamb. We're going to explain that in just a second. Stein, in that original article, explains that the literary forms of the Seder and Agatha also echo those of the symposia. For example, the four questions are really quite simple. Compare Plutarch, the question, the quote, the question should be easy, the problem known, the interrogation is plain and familiar, so that, may, that they may either vex the unlearned nor frighten them. This is how they would have the symposium. They would have people sitting around asking simple questions, so they would have sort of brief uh, conversation. Many symposium questions discuss food, for example. Does sea or land afford better food? Why is hunger allayed by drinking, but thirst increased by eating? Why do the Pythagoreans forbid fish more than other foods? These are the type of questions that you have at a Greek symposium. Let's get, and we, we, and we have four questions, what we refer to as, when you ask questions, to try, when you teach by asking questions, what do we call this, all the professors and the teachers? What kind of, what method do we call that? Jump in any time. Socratic Inquiry. method. The Socratic method, right? Mm -hmm. Socrates was Greek. <laughs> right? And so therefore, this is all Greek method. This is the Jewish method. It's based on the Socratic method, which is which obviously is from Athens and not from Jerusalem. The Haggadah continues. The Haggadah relates the famous story about the five sages reclining in B'nai Brak, quote, talking about the exodus from Egypt that entire night. Similarly, Macrobius, early fifth century, relates that, quote, during the Saturnalia, Remember the Saturnalia was the holiday that they celebrated at the end of December. Um, and when those of us who attended my class on Hanukkah, where I ruined Hanukkah for everybody, focused on the holiday of Saturnalia. So during the, ho the Saturnalia holiday, distinguished members of the aristocracy and other scholars assembled at the house of Vitius, Pratextictus, I don't, sounds, sounds good. Anybody want to correct my, my pronunciation? You're more welcome to to celebrate the festive time solemnly by a discord of fitting free men. And the host explained the origin of the cult and the cause of the festival. And sometimes, as is the Seder, the symposium lasted until dawn. At Plato's symposium, the crowing of the cock reminds the guest to go home. So when the, when the students come in and say, Rabbi Akiva, it's time that we've been going all night. You didn't realize it's gone all night long. It's similar. They're telling the story when the five rabbis of Abraham, they're doing the same thing that they did in the symposium. 
One must explain, according to the Mishnah and the Haggadah, Pesach, Matzah, and Mara at the Seder. And the items must be lifted up when explaining them. Similarly, Macrobius related the Simachus, take, which takes some nuts into his hands, and asked Servius about the cause and origin of the variety of names given to them. Servius and Gavius Basis then, then give two different etymologies for the word walnuts, juggling. Another example, we're almost finished. At the Seder we recite Nishmat Kochai, and it says the beautiful Ilufina were our mouths filled with song as the sea, our lips with the adoration, the spacious firmament, were your eyes radiant as the sun and the moon, we would still be unable to thank and bless your name sufficiently, O Lord our God. Similarly, Menander in the fourth century gives an example of a logo basilikos, the words praising the king, as the eyes cannot measure the endless sea, thus one cannot easily describe the fame of the emperor. And so what we've just given is a whole number of examples where, where the Seder, where does the Seder, the practices of the Seder come from? The practice of the Seder seems to come from, and really there's very few who are going to disagree with this, the Seder comes from how the symposium would be run during the time of the Mishnah and the Talmud for the aristocrats. And so it would make sense that when the rabbis are putting together the night of festival of freedom, a night to celebrate, they would center it around what they were most familiar with as the state, the, a, a time of that the aristocrats, everybody is the, has the law, has the ruling of a king, as royalty, as aristocracy, and therefore they would try to replicate what they knew. Comes 2,000 years later, 1,500 years later, and we're trying to figure out what all the things that they did and why are they doing it? Why do they dip the salt water into the thing? And we come up with different answers, but the reality is it seems to be clear that they are trying, that they had an agenda. The agenda was to replicate as best and close as possible the similarities of what the, or the aristocrats did at that time. Now that's true and not true because again, the, the rabbis at the time of the Talmud are living in Babylonia, and who is the supreme power at the time? Let's say at the time of the uh, at the time of the Mishnah, at the time of the Talmud, who's running the who's the empire at the time? Carl, if you have something, you got to, you got to mute, unmute yourself. I thought the Babylonian you. Empire. The Babylonian Empire has crumbled at the time of. They, they crumbled pretty soon, actually. They're, they're long gone. The Babylonian Empire was at the time of the first temple period, when they destroyed the first temple. Then you have the Persians. Then you have the Greeks. I should clarify. Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks. And what follows? The Romans. The Romans. The Romans. Thank you. So there was, was that Lauren there, our history yeah. teacher? Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Right, so the Romans. This is Sorry, Roman I'm time. Getting ready for Passover, so that's why I'm not showing my face. No worries, I'm I'm gonna shut my face off too soon. Right, so <laughs> <laughs> to fit in with everyone else, the Romans. It, where this is Roman times. This isn't Greek times, but the the, the impact of the Greeks it was it played such an impact of the what this symposium looked like that they were still talking about. The Greeks are long gone, but they're still talking about it even during Roman times. Again, some of the practices seem to be adopted by the Romans as well, but they really are trying to replicate the Greek symposium, not the Roman uh, practices. Now, with that said, the question that comes in is that, well, why, so then why do we do this? It sounds so not kosher, right? <laughs> it sounds so inappropriate. So here I am and I'm dipping the, salt, the lettuce into the, or the carpas into the salt water, and I'm thinking, and they say, well, this is what they used to do back then. I'm like, yeah, but it's not what I do back then. And by the way, we didn't like them. Why should we try to replicate what they did? Forget about that. It was 2,000 years ago. Why am I replicating? It's not a Jewish thing. It's a non-Jewish thing. Why would, I, why would I have the Seder, the night that is so center to the Jewish people, why would I be replicating what the Greeks did? Everybody hear the question? Yes. Anybody, any questions we have so far before we try to challenge and start to tackle this question? Peter, did you, I, I, I don't know if you were trying to talk or you, had, <laughs> you were speaking under your breath. <laughs> Talking to my daughter who walked in the room. Okay, good. We encourage that. That's, uh, okay. 
Um, any questions we have so far? Okay, good. I want to highlight a few things that were very di that were different. That while things were very similar and clearly replicated, clearly they were the goal was to try to recreate this. At the same time, there was a, a intentional agenda to do things slightly different. For example, some of them were very innocuous, but of course, how many cups of wine do we have? We have four cups of wine. Right? And what does it say in the fourth in this uh, Tiffany's? It said, I want you to honor the gods to the extent of three cups of wine. But they had three cups of wine, we have four cups of wine. Sounds like a small difference, but it's not. Right? Um, we're gonna skip that a second. Um, what what I want to focus on. And now there are other small nuances, but what I want to go through is I want to go through the Seder and how we know the Seder. And I want to show that some of the things that, and you could, again, you'll sound really smart, I think, when you share this at your Seder, that the things that we do that come up as we go through Kaddish, Orchatz, Karpatz, Magid, and the discussion of Magid, we're going to see they were directly as an attack or to counter the culture of the Greeks, the culture of the symposium. Let's look at what the symposium is. I wanted to get a full translation. I found this. A symposium is a communion of serious and mirthful, mirthful entertainment, discourse, and actions. It is meant to further a deeper insight into those points that were debated at table, for the remembrance of those pleasures which arise from meat and drink is not genteel and short-lived. But the subjects of philosophical queries and discussions remain always fresh after they are imparted and they relish by those who are absent as well as by those who are present at dinner. So they would, they would have this huge, um, um, this huge meal with all the delicacies and wine. And we're going to see that actually things became slightly different. And there's one particular phrase that's highlighted in the Haggadah that tells us how, how, so how um, focused this was in regards to the Greek, uh, the Greek customs and the Greek symposium. There's one word that comes up all the time. We actually mentioned it before. That comes up. That comes up actually uh, in, uh, in during the seder. That doesn't have any. That, that that makes no sense whatsoever. It is not a word. It's a Greek word. What is that? What word that is part of our seder every year? That's a Greek word. And highlight. Well, the well Afi Coleman is a Greek word. Afikomen is 100% a Greek word. And in yeah, fact, you, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I mean, uh, you told me this is a new class, which it is, but Rabbi Miller gave a little drush about this about 15 years ago, so I know where we're heading on this. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So what's amazing, I'm going to take a moment to, to congratulate Peter for remembering what Rabbi Miller of Blessed Memory <laughs> exactly. said, uh, said 15 years ago, so it's very impressive. It also, if we're uh, repeating the Torah, Rabbi Miller, it should be in his schut as well. He passed away. Uh, last year, this past That's year. That's actually why I mentioned it, so we should kind of, you know, so it, it, it should, it should have an Aliyah, was a very special person, Rabbi Miller. Um, and, um, great. <laughs> so let's, let's go through some of the Rabbi Miller's Torah here. So let, we have, um, we have the, of the four children, we have the four, the four sons, as they're referred to, we have the wife's son, the Russia, the wicked son, uh, the, the simple son, and the child who doesn't know how to ask, Right, so always, uh, I, I tried when I was growing up, I tried to be the wise one. We had my brother, he was the wicked one. Um, then we had my uncle who was the bitter herb, um, but, uh, but that's, that's for Eben Lor. Um, and here we have the Chacham speaking. Uh, they have the Chacham, the wise son asks the question. Chacham Mahu Omer, what does the wise son say? He says, What are these testaments, statutes, and judgments that the Lord our God is commanding you? Now, those of you who remember, and again, we've we mentioned this many times, the, the wise son never actually says this. There are four places in the Torah, four places in the Torah where it answers, it says, when your child will ask, or, and it says, uh, and, 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 it's, and there are four places where it says it, and you give a response. And so therefore, the rabbis took from this and said, oh, there must be four different types of children that you're supposed to be answering to. We've explained many times, Deborah Cohen knows this by heart, because I said it every year. By the way, I said that this class is a new class. 
but the old stuff was good. I just want to mention, <laughs> so we repeat it sometimes because it was good, that these are th th corresponding with four different types of children. You have the, 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 co the college students, you have the high school students, you have the, the preteen, and you have the, the child who doesn't know what to ask. You never, all these are, you're supposed to educate your children, Chanach Lanar Al Darko, and you educate a child according to their ways. But here is the wise child, so to speak, and they say, what are these testimony statutes and judgments of the Lord our God who commanded you? And according to you, uh, you should say to him, as per the laws of the past of sacrifice, Ein maftirin achara Pesach afikomen. We may not eat in afikomen after the Pesach sacrifice. That is the answer we give to the Chacham, which is fascinating because that is a Mishnah, which we'll see, it's actually a Mishnah at the, the end of the, of the, of the tractate of Pesachim, it's, an issue. it's not a law of the Karim Pesach, and it brings up this Greek word of afikomen, which we don't even know what it means. It's translated as dessert or the Karim Pesach. We don't maftir and we don't have anything, we don't leave after the Pesach afikomen. The rabbis want to understand what this means. And so we have, if it's source number four, it says, the Gemara asks, what is the meaning of afikomen? So Rav said it means that a member of a group that ate the Passover lamb together should not leave the group to join another group. That's the first opinion. So in Laftir in Achara Pesach Avikomen, you shouldn't leave after the Karban Pesach for the Koman, for the Avikoman. So it's not this dessert, but it's you shouldn't you shouldn't leave after the Passover sacrifice. And then what does it say? They have another opinion. And Shmuel says it means that one may not eat dessert after the meal, like mushrooms for me and chicks for Abba, et cetera, et cetera such as dates, roasted grains, and nuts, uh, and one does not uh, conclude, uh, and it says, Rabbi Yochanan said, one does not include by eating after the Passover lamb foods such as dates, roasted grains, and nuts. You shouldn't have dessert. So there are two answers that are given. The first answer is given is that you shouldn't leave after the, after the Passover sacrifice. You have to stay in your own house. And the second answer it's given is that you shouldn't have any dessert afterwards. And that's actually the practice that we have, is that after we have the we don't have a Passover sacrifice. So instead, what do we do? We have our concluding food is more matzah because you can never have enough matzah, right? So you have, our, our, so we, after you eat that afikomen for matzah, you're not supposed to eat anything else afterwards. You don't have any more dessert. That's when the meal is supposed to end and you're supposed to then just have more wine, singhal, nirza, all these other things, but you don't eat anything afterwards. In fact, there's a question of whether or not you're supposed to brush your teeth, which we'll leave off. What does, what is the point of this? The point of this is, is we'll that hear him we have to know what the, what the, was a paycheck, maybe. what the original Afikomen was. The original Afikomen we said was that after the symposium, people would go out to their homes, they would eat, I'm sorry, they would eat more nuts and dates and things to make them more thirsty so they would drink more. And their, their symposium, which was a setting where people had discussions, philosophical discussions about uh, theology and man, et cetera, et cetera, would end in, and we're keeping our family rating, but would end in some sort of orgy in the entire neighborhood. And so, ironically, when the rabbi, it's not ironic, the rabbis knew what exactly they were saying. They were saying, what, what is this service? What are, what are we doing this thing, says the wise son? You know what it is? What are these laws? Let me tell you what, it, what, what does it mean to be Jewish? Let me tell you what it means to be Jewish. Don't do what they do. Their symposium led to, after their whole discussion would lead to more drunkenness and then lewdness. No, 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 you're not allowed to go anywhere. You stay here. That's number one. And number two, you don't eat anything anymore because it's not about after the meal. Now we go and drink and party, right? It's kind of like, I remember when I went to visit my friend in college, I didn't go on a, a campus, but my friend went to a college, which remained nameless, but at the time was the number three party school in the country. And then when, by the, the time the year ended, it was the number one party school in the country. And many of our, many people, many people we know go to that school. And I, after they would go, they would have Friday night services. They'd have dinner at uh, Hillel or Chabad. And then they would go and get drunk off their, uh, off their, uh, off the deep end on Friday night. That was the practice, right? So basically, that's what it's describing. He says, no, 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 no. When we finish the meal 
and the our symposium, our seder, it's going to be very different. And this is what you tell your kids. This is what you tell the wise son. You tell them a law that is specifically geared to say, you know what they do? We don't do that. When we finish, we stay here. We don't leave. And when we finish, we don't eat any more that'll lead to more drinking because that is not appropriate. And it's really a highlight of, um, if you look at, uh, this, is, this is the explanation by Saul Lieberman, uh, and I found this quote here. It says, one may not conclude the Pesach meal or the Navi Komen. This is an explanation. Somebody used an explanation to explain what this means. So Lieberman, the great Talmudic scholar of the past century, explained that Avikomen refers to the Greco-Roman custom to engage in revelry at the conclusion of the symposium, symposium, the formal meal. People would go from house to house drinking and carousing. I don't know what carousing means, but it doesn't sound good. The rabbis prohibited this custom, preferred instead that a Jew should discuss the laws of Pesach and the story of the Exodus until the morning prayers. As an aside, the fact that the rabbis had to assert the difference between the Seder and the Symposium strengthens the theory that the two were essentially not all that different. In the essence, the Seder was a Jewish symposium, as some scholars, scholars have called it. The Talmud, um, the Talmud explains, and this is the second explanation, the Talmud explains the word Avikoman in two ways. First of all, it may mean that one should not go out from one's house to the other. And secondly, it may mean that one should not eat anything after the Pesach. Lieberman explains both as referring to the Greeks' custom of revelry. The food which wet, wet, which the Talmud describes were meant to wet one's appetite so that one would, would wish to drink more, get drunk, and follow with lewd behavior. So as we're saying is that, yes, it is follows, the rabbis intended to follow the symposium model, but then explain, we do things differently. Our behavior is very different than their behavior. In fact, even this word apikomen comes from the word epikomazin, the Greek custom of ending a party by bursting out into the street and into other people's homes and forcing them to join the party. Jews don't do that. In fact, we even have a source from the Talmud Yushalmi. It says, in source number seven, when they had finished eating and drinking, they began to clap and dance. They being those Greeks, uh, who that's how they party, Elezer said to Rabbi Shua, instead of occupying ourselves with their customs, let us sit and occupy ourselves with our own customs. And they sat and occupied themselves with the words of the Torah. And now it makes sense. We have the story of the five rabbis. And we tell over the story of the five rabbis in B'nai Brak. We have the story that they say, it's not you rabbis. You've been talking about the Seder and, the, uh, uh, and Torah all night. You've been mentioning, you've been discussing the Exodus all night long. It's time to get up and pray. It's not time to get up and party, which is what the Greeks did at the time. And in truth, this is just one example of many where there were the Haggadah, you can go through the Haggadah and you'll see that things are di different. Things were different than they, uh, the rabbis intended things to be different in the Seder, specifically to counter the behavior of the Greeks. Let's go for example. We have the Haggadah starts with halach ma'anya. This is the bread of, of affliction, of destitution, that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Anyone who is famished should come and eat. Anyone who is in need should come and partake of the Passover sacrifice. Now we are here. Next year we will be in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves. Next year we will be free people. Let's think about this idea of a symposium. The symposium was set up specifically for the aristocrats the most brilliant people, and only those who were invited would be able to participate, and they were the elite of the elite. Comes along Judaism and says, no, 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 no. We have a very different model. Every single person, every single member of our, of our tribe participates in the Seder. Even the poor people, even the people who are destitute, all of them come, and anybody who's hungry should come and eat. Anybody who's hungry should come and eat. Yes, I'm happy we're going to share the source sheet later on. Um, anybody who's hungry should come and eat. What are they saying? They're saying that, no, this is not an elitist thing. This is not a, a gathering of the upper echelon of aristocracy. Everyone, anyone who's famished should come and participate in this because that's not what they do. That's what we do. We don't believe in elitism. We don't believe in that idea, that concept, that we just forget about those who are... Um, 
those who are not part of our group, those who are not the elite, those who are not brilliant and beautiful, etc., which was the Greek philosophy, everyone is included. And they started this Haggadah, they started Hamagad with the first thing to say, this is not what they do at the symposium, this is how we do it. In addition, by the way, the centerpiece of the Haggadah, while they talk about philosophy and uh, theology, etc., our centerpiece talks about the fact, and we get it out right away, that we were slaves. A part of the Greek philosophy also was the concept of determinism, which is well, where you come from, where, where your status is, is where you're destined to be. So if I was a noble, if I was, in a, then I was born a noble, then I'm supposed to be a noble. If everybody remembers the feudal system, right? And from, from sixth grade, right? So uh, is that when we learn it? I'll ask Lauren, right? So everybody remembers the, the feudal system. Where you're born is where you end up. That is your status. Judaism counters that. And by the way, the greatest example of that is from the book of Genesis. Where do we learn in the book of Genesis that where you are born is not where you remain? Where your status is socially on the social um, ladder is not where you remain. Where do we have an example of that from the book of Genesis? Joseph in Egypt. Joseph in Egypt. Joseph is the, thank you, Peter, you're doing a great job today. Joseph in Egypt is the prime example of this, which is counter to a complete culture that says, no, no, no. Here was Joseph who was, a, not, it's not just a rags to riches story. We're a little bit used to this idea in America right? That somebody, anybody could be anything they want, which is an amazing idea. Forever, this was never the case. Joseph comes along and introduces this revolutionary idea. He goes from being a slave and a foreigner to a nobleman in the second in command. He marries a noble, a, a, the daughter of a nobleman, a priest, and the second in command. That is something that is phenomenal. Okay, thank Lauren is telling us, feudalism is learned in elementary school, and then again in ninth grade, both European and Japanese feudalism. So I didn't know about Japanese feudalism. So now I'm smarter and I can share that at my Seder this year. So <laughs> thank you, Lauren. Um, and so here right away, what do we say? We say now we were slaves, next year we'll be free. And it's telling us what, like, that, that statement doesn't belong here. It belongs there right away to say that this goes counter to the whole symposium idea that we're all born aristocrats and will remain aristocrats, no. We were born slaves and we will become free. That is specifically counter to that, to their, to that concept. Let's continue in, this, in the Magid. Hold on one second. Okay, so we have source number nine. Um, again, that really continues this idea. We say, we spend the entire night talking about where we come from. And everybody is invited to do this. Everybody should, where we come from, we come from slave roots, we come from uh, and, that, and that's not what our destiny was. Um, we have the four sons, right? Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu. Let us play, praise God. Blessed be, blessed is the one who gave the Torah to his people Israel. Blessed be, Kars, uh, uh, that the, we thank God who gave the Torah to the Jewish people. And that is, you know, what, what is the uniqueness of the Jewish people? What is the source of our brilliance? Our source of our brilliance is our Torah, our tradition. That is, that, that is the source of our brilliance. And then, so what should we do in the symposium? We will have all the scholars come together and philosophize and theorize about the Torah. What do we do instead? We invite the children. The Torah is referring to four sons, four children. We invite the children. Let me tell you, with the children at a symposium, there would be no place for them, right? I remember when I was a kid, right? The shul was no place for children, right? That was a terrible thing. Judaism has just the opposite. At the Seder, its centerpiece is the children because not, and not, not the philosophers and not the elitists and not the, the, the aristocrats. It's about the children. And if they spill their wine and their grape juice on Plato's, on Plato's Agada, so be it. That's fine. And we celebrate that. And finally, I want to get to source number 11. And there we have something, and this is where Rabbi Soloveitchik um, point, pointed out. Um, the, 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 when we get to Eliyahu Navi. Now, the story of Eliyahu Navi, and I told, I told Peter we're not going to learn about Eliyahu Navi, so we're, because <laughs> I have a whole other class that I've probably given 17 times about Elijah the prophet. It's a good class. You should see the highlights. Um, but Eliyahu Anavi 
this, the, the Elijah the prophet being introduced into the Haggadah is a very strange thing, along with the fifth cup of wine. So we finish Birkat Amazon, we make a Bore Priya Gafen, but I remember from last year, and then we open the door for Elio Anabi. And in most Haggadahs comes this phrase from Psalm 79, and many of them have taken it out because they feel it's politically incorrect. And I disagree because much of the themes of the Haggadah in truth centers around, we spoke about this a couple weeks ago, centers around the idea that behold, and every generation they've tried to destroy us. If you think about it, right, most, a majority, an overwhelming majority of Sadarim in the Jewish history has been at a time of oppression and a time where the enemies of the Jews were overwhelming them. We have a, um, let's say we're spoiled. We think we really are. Thank God we live in a time where they're, they're, you know, where we don't have to worry about going out to our, outside our house and worry about um, blood libels or anything like that. We do have people in this world who still want to destroy us. But we live, thankfully, we live in, in peaceful times in the, in, the, in the Medinat Shel Chesed, in the wonderful country that we live in. But nonetheless, most of the time, for thousands of years, it was not the case. And Pesach in particular was a time of, of that anti-Semitism would rise on the calendar. And so what we do when we invite Eliyahu and Navi is we open up the door and we say, Shvo chamatcha el agayim, ucha. Pour your wrath upon the nations that did not know you and upon the kingdoms that did not call upon your name. Since they have consumed Yaakov and laid waste his habitation, pour out your fury upon them and the fierceness of your anger shall reach them. You shall pursue them with anger and eradicate them from under the skies of the Lord. And the Haggadah is a strange thing to have. Because here we are, we have three cups of wine, right? We've already had three cups of wine. We're pretty schnockered at this point. We've had a full meal. Nobody wants to eat another drop of anything anyway. And we have had plenty of the bread of affliction in our systems. And so we're, we're totally full. You would think this is the time that we would say, okay, great. And by the way, what happens right afterwards? Now we have Hallel and we sing praises to God and we have Nishmat and Yishtabach and all these wonderful things about the global redemption. Even the songs that we have in Nirzah are all about the global redemption, the redemption of the world, not just the Jewish people. The truth is, is that the first half of the Haggadah is centered, is Jew-centered, is centered about the, re the redemption of the Jewish people. The second half of the Haggadah really is centered around the redemption of the world and God's presence in this world, as well as appreciation and thanks. And so it's at this point, we should just be putting our feet back and saying, wow, God, God, yeah. It's a good life. And the truth is, is those of us who will get really tired and say, all right, let's rush from the end. <laughs> and we, let's do Chagadja and get who knows when, let's get out of here. But in truth, in truth, this, so this, this phrase, this paragraph doesn't belong there, which is why some Chagadahs decided not to get, to get rid of it. But it has a significant role. Rabbi Soloveitchik explains why is it there. It's there specifically at the time for Eliyahu Hanavi's cup, the cup of Elijah. Leo Anavi, who was Leo Anavi? Leo Anavi was the prophet um, who was a, a, a who was had incredible powers, but he in, in legend and lore, as he was he was in the Torah and actually in, in, in the Navi in, in the beginning of the Book of Kings, two it mentions that he was taken to the next world in a fiery chariot, and that he returns to this world to resolve problems, to resolve questions that come up. In fact, in the Talmud. Whenever there is a question that is unresolvable, a debate that is unresolvable, or a question that is unresolvable, they say teku, which means it ends in a tie. We're going to have to wait till Eliyahu Hanavi, till Elijah the prophet comes with the Messiah, and he will, he will answer this question. The reality is, and the truth is, is that going back, we've mentioned this before, the, there, there, there is a debate in the Talmud between the, Jehovah Jewish, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud should there be, I'm going to actually close this so we can see everybody again. Should there be a fourth cup or should there only, be, or should there be a fifth cup? We don't know this. In the Talmud, we mentioned this in the past, there's a fifth cup. It's because there's actually four, five languages of redemption. The fifth language, and I think we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, 
is about the Heveti, about bringing us to the land of Israel. And there's a debate in the Talmud. The Talmud says that there should be a fifth cup in the Jerusalem Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud says there should be a fourth cup. So what do we do? We drink four cups, but we leave a fifth cup, and we call that the cup of Elijah. Why? Because we invite Elijah in, and he's going to be the one who answers the question. We say, we don't know. Should we drink this? Should we not drink this? And just like we do with all other questions of debate, questions where we don't, not debate, but questions where we left unanswered, so we say, oh, Let's call Elijah when the Messiah will come and he'll answer the question. And every year he comes, he drinks a little bit of wine and then he goes to somebody else's house and then he goes down the chimney and has cookies and milk. No, that was a different guy, right? But uh, I was telling people, people, somebody told me they went, they're going to their kid's Seder in New Jersey. And I said, I know Elijah comes to New Jersey last because of the bridge, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> but Elijah shows up at everybody's house. He's not showing up. We're praying that one day he's going to come and he'll answer this question. And what we have right there in the middle of our Seder, which in, if you, in, is in the symposium, you have, the, the, you have this glorification of man who can sit there and philosophize and, the, and, and, and theorize and come up with all of the answers of life. In Judaism, at the apex, really when we're finished Magid, we've done everything, what do we have? we have a question. We don't know what to do. We are left without an answer. And so the rabbis instituted this, and Rabbi Soloveitchik explained this, Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, and said, and here's the great quote, a Jew must know that there are things that he doesn't know. And that in Judaism, within Judaism, it, there is a concept called the chok. We read about the para aduma, the red heifer, there's a concept called where we have wool and linen, you're not allowed to wear shotness together. You have all these weird laws that make no sense and there are no explanations. And why is that? Said Rabbi Soloveitchik, and who was one of the most brilliant people who ever lived. <laughs> and he said, a Jew must know it's fundamental that a Jew must know that there are things that he doesn't know. Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik told a very a story which I'm probably gonna butcher, but I'll. I'll, I'll, I'm going to summarize and be as succinct as possible. He told in this class, he said there was somebody, uh, a, 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 one who won the, uh, the Nobel Prize for economics on, and had a center of rationalism. And he was, was, and when you win the Nobel Prize, you're supposed to receive the award in Sweden. Um, and uh, so the problem he had was is that you have to wear a tuxedo. And the tuxedos that they had in Sweden um, there was a concern about shotness. Shotness is wool and linen together. It's a biblical prohibition. And sure enough, they checked it out. And it turns out that, yes, that the, the tuxedo that they were renting for them, they brought them a tuxedo, had shotness in it. He said, I can't use it. So that what they did is they called Israel and they flew a tuxedo from Israel to Sweden that had been checked for shotness and it was cleared. And that way he had this. Now here was... And the irony, and again, I, I, Rabbi Soloveitchik told it much better, but the irony of the story was, here was this person who was at the, the head of his, of his field, right? And the leader of his field, receiving the Nobel Prize in Sweden on economics and the center, and it has a center called rationalism. And he had to go through this whole fakakta thing because he couldn't wear a, a, a tuxedo that had wool and linen together, which makes no sense whatsoever, because that's... Judaism. Within Judaism, there is always a piece that we're not going to understand, and that this becomes a center, a great piece of the Seder, an exciting piece, right? Everybody gets excited. We open the door for Elio. We see if the table shakes and he drinks a little wine. It's really saying, Elio, come in here. We don't know everything. What Rabbi Soloveitchik explained, and this is the counter to the Greek philosophy and the Greek Symposium, Rabbi Soloveitchik said, this was that the greatness of man has to be also centered with the humility of man. The Greeks celebrated the greatness of man. We celebrate both the greatness and the humility of man, what Rabbi Soloveitchik called majesty and humility. That is the balance. We can do amazing things. We can, put a, we can come up with a, with a cure for a pandemic in, in, in months when it should take 10 years, we can conquer everything. And at the same time, 
we are humbled because we recognize that there's someone in charge and we don't understand everything. And that plays the center. That's where the cup of Elijah comes in to counter the symposium. And then we say those phrases. We go outside and we say, dear God, we live in a world that cannot be explained. There is so much injustice. Why is it that all these wonderful, nice people have been suffering and have anti-Semitism and have, and where, where is justice in this world, God? The same question that Abraham asks in Barjad Vayera about Sodom. God forbid that you would be unjust. And we answer that question as well. And we make a statement that says, we don't understand everything. And we close the door and we sing the praises of God. And as inconsistent as that seems, that is the beauty of the Seder, specifically to counter the culture of the symposium. And the rabbis 2,000 years ago came up with this brilliant idea. We're gonna do it like they do it, because they do it, but we're gonna show that what they do, we do differently. You know, when we finish a tractate in Talmud, we just finished, tomorrow we make a siyam, we just finished the dafyomi, sechet p'sachim, and we say, anurutzim v'heim rutzim. They run and we run. Anurutzim l'kabal schar v'heim rutzim lo l'kabal schar. We run to receive reward and they run not to receive reward. You know, there was actually, there was, um, there was a picture I think it was about seven years ago. This is before pictures became big, right? People, these snapshots. So there was a picture of, um, the, they had the, the, the um, on the way to the CMA Shah, so it said, on the, it said direction. So on the, in the electronic screen, it said, it said CMA Shah's this way, racetrack that way, right? <laughs> and, and, and you could choose which way you run, and someone wrote, under ruts and behave ruts, and they're running and we're running. The, in the part of the night that is the, the, uh, such a, plays such a central role in our, in our people, the night that, that we are responsible to teach our children what Judaism is all about and our grandchildren, where that is the biblical obligation. That's what we're there to do. Ra the rabbis 1,500 years ago understood we need to actually take the culture that's around us and show how we do it differently. And I think that, and to me, it seems pretty clear that was the origin of the Seder. And now why do we have 4,000 different books now? Well, because we got to modernize it. And now we have to really, we do have to say, this is how we do things differently today. This is what they do, and this is what we do. And you know, I, I was listening, um, we'll end with this. I was listening to uh, a beautiful talk by uh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, which I'm going to be sharing over the next couple of weeks. It was really beautiful. Was, uh, and, but he, he talked about the centerpiece of the bayit, of the home, that the night of the Seder, it says in the, it says the word, in, in the Torah, it says the word bayit 14 times. And that the, the bayit, the home of the Jewish, the Jewish home has always been the centerpiece. And the truth is, is that the Egyptians didn't understand that. The Egyptians said, there's a sermon here, so when I say it a different time, you'll, you'll make believe you never heard it before. The Egyptian said, what do you, you know, said, yeah, you, where, where, is, where is religion? Religion is for the Kohanim and the, the priests, where they go to the church or the temple. That's where religion is. When Moses, Moshe goes to Paro and says, listen, we're leaving. We got to go. We want to go to a festival. And Paro goes, who's coming? And he says, um, well, our, our, the elders and the young and the children and our families, we're all going. And Paro's like, what are you, crazy? I'm not letting you out. Oh, yeah. So we thought, I thought, I always read it because Paro's like, oh, they think he, he, he doesn't trust Moshe. Moshe's going to make a run for it. No, Paro didn't understand philosophically. What are you doing? <laughs> why, 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 why do you need, who, only the priest should go. You're, you're the, you're the Moses, Moshe, you're the priest, you go. Why is everybody going? Right? And then the first thing that Judaism tells us them to do when they become a nation is they say, go home and have a Seder. Because Judaism is not just in shul. Everybody remember where shul is? Judaism is not just in shul. Judaism starts in the home and is in shul, by the way. Just saying that and time to go back to shul. But Judaism starts in the home. And you can imagine, just imagine someone shows up to my house on Shabbos. They show up to my house on Shabbos. My house is not whatever. I don't think. And what do they see? 
they see that we are, our, our phones are off, our computers are off, we're sitting down to have a Shabbos meal, we make Kiddush, we have challah, we sit around the table, we say some Divrei Torah and some other stuff. We sing some songs, actually, it's just me singing songs and my kids are rolling their eyes at me, but whatever. They're going to witness this and they're going to say, is this a temple? Is this a shul? Is this a synagogue? No, this is my house. This is how we do it. And on the night of the pa of Passover, the truth is that the theme of the rabbis had all those years ago was say, that's how they do it. Let me show you how we do it. And this is how we'll be able to perpetuate our people and our faith. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, for clapping. I appreciate it. <laughs> Any questions, comments before we wrap up? Uh, well, thank, I, I'm such a good teacher. Very interesting. I'll say that. Thank you, Sima. So, I, I, so did everybody get smarter and they could say smart things at their Seder? Oh, my. Absolutely. Good, good. Um, Sima asked me to, to share my source sheet, so I'm going to do that right here. Hold on a second. Uh, so what do I have to do? I have to copy it and I'm gonna, then- I'm going to put email? it in the chat, if I could just figure that, and then you could copy it. I think this okay. should, doesn't work, then let me know. Um, but you should be able to, um, you should be able to get the, the, the oh. that should work. It's from Safaria. And uh, okay. I'm happy to send it to you. And I hope, um, I hope, well, bring me to your Seder. That would be great. Bring me, uh, <laughs> bring to it and say, Rabbi, I haven't said this or whatever. You don't, by the way, you don't have to say that. My, my Chavi's grandfather used to say this to me all the time. He's like, you, could, you don't have to quote me. Just, tell, just say it. It's brilliant, but you don't have to quote me. You'll sound smart, right? <laughs> so you don't have to quote me. Just sound smart and uh, bring, bring some new insights into your Seder. Wishing everybody, it's so, so much fun to study with you. I thank you for that. We'll, we'll just say that Jewish Orthodox, Greek Orthodox is one and the same. That's right. Well, I always tell people that, the Greek Orthodox. We have, by the way, Julie's here as Greek Orthodox. But <laughs> we have, I always tell people, ask me, how's the Jewish community, how's the Orthodox Jewish community in, in America? And I say the Orthodox community in America is growing leaps and bounds, but it's the Greek Orthodox community. So the, the, they're, they're, they're getting huge. They keep building more buildings. It's really, really beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Kane your boo. Uh, <laughs> the creeks are back. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you, Rabbi, thank, you, thank Rabbi. you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Take care, Joe. Thank you. Happy Pesach, everyone. Happy Pesach, everyone. Be well. Thank you.